resolved that traditional age creationism is the correct interpretation of Genesis. And today we have Dr. Robert Sunjanis, um, and he's going to be de debating again with Brendan Kyer. And I wanted to just begin this debate with a prayer. So Hugh, would you please, please lead us in a prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. O oh, Father, on this glorious feast of the ascension of our Lord into heaven, we ask you to send the Holy Ghost upon us. And through the prayers of our Immaculate Mother, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to the truth so that we could know the truth. We ask the precious blood of Jesus to convict, convert, cleanse, heal, and sanctify us all, including all those who watch or listen to this discussion. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, through the intercession of our Mother Mary, St. Joseph, and all the holy angels and saints. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. So let's start with a uh, brief introduction from Brendan, and we'll try to keep this to around three minutes. So uh, you may begin. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Brendan Kyer. I uh, am uh, currently an atheist, grew up Protestant, uh, converted to Catholicism after college, uh, primarily because I never really uh, doubted that the foundations of Christianity were true. Uh, I just uh, wanted to follow the most pure form of it, uh, which I believed to be Catholicism. Um, I was Catholic for a few years, um, had a bit of a change of life circumstances that uh, one gave me some more free time and two uh, necessitated a much deeper dive into logic in preparation for a test into law school. Um, while preparing for that, uh, I really became faced with the fact that some of my beliefs were based off of logical fallacies. Um, started to have a few questions about some of the things I believed, and uh, similar to tugging at the wrong string on a sweater, right? Uh, it, what was a small issue became a big issue, became a lot of big issues, became the cessation of a sweater. Um, so I, in delving into all of this, and I, I really, really did a deep dive into um, the Old Testament, then the New Testament, then the philosophical arguments for the existence of God. Um, and just the more I dug, the more questions I had, the fewer answers that I had. And really when I took a step back and looked at everything, I realized that um, the picture was not pointing towards uh, the Bible being reliable, Christianity being true, um, and that I was no longer convinced, right? So um stopped believing uh, would be the best um i guess summation of that uh so i still do my best to stay as active in the scholarly field as i can and really try to engage with all of the arguments and really try to explore everything i can right um there's always a chance that i could be wrong and i try to always be open to having my mind changed with sufficient evidence uh and data um and I try to engage with these conversations with other people because I think that uh, they're important. And I think that it's important for us to believe as many uh, true things and as few false things as possible. All right, thank you. And now Robert, could you spend a few minutes also telling us a little bit about you? Sure, um, I am a Catholic apologist and have been so since 1992 when I came back to the Catholic Church after being a Protestant for 17 years. Uh, I was born and raised a Catholic uh, in the 60s and early 70s. And then I, when I was in college at George Washington University studying physics, um, I had a what you would call a dramatic conversion experience, like... God was right in my dormitory room speaking to me. Not that I heard anything, but just 
I went I went to sleep one night with the Bible verse on my mind that I had read that night, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then there's more to that verse. But that's what Jesus said to the people. And I felt like Jesus was right there talking to me in my room. Again, I didn't hear anything, but it was some, something was going on. And I woke up the next morning and I knew that I was not the same person I was when I went to sleep that night. And that was back in 1975. The, the Lord had touched me in a special way. And um, I immediately left my pre-med uh, curriculum uh, and went into uh, theology. Then I went to Bible college for a year. Then I came back to George Washington University and got my degree in religion, uh, Bachelor of Arts in religion. And then I went to a Protestant seminary, was there for a few years and got my master's. And um, so I was on my way to be a Protestant preacher and I was doing well in that. And um, like I said, back in 1992, I had heard arguments for the Catholic church that I had never heard before. And I, that was at a time in my life where I was really thinking about these things because I saw a lot of problems in Protestantism. Everybody believed something different, no matter what church you went to. And I wanted stability. I wanted to believe what the truth really was because they all can't be right, of course. Uh, so I saw that the Catholic Church claimed to have the truth above everybody else. And I went in and studied it and I saw that it was true. And uh, so it's been that way ever since. And at that same time, I was so enthralled with the Catholic Church that I created my own apologetics organization and um, have been doing that ever since. So that's almost what? That's over 30 years now that I've been doing that. And, and even as a Protestant, I had a penchant for the sciences because I was a physics major and a chemistry major. Uh, so I got into the evolution debates, I got into the cosmology debates, everything that I could just get my hands on I wanted to know about. And um, that's why I can debate this topic today, um, because I'm very familiar with all the science, all the theology, all the biblical exegesis that it takes to um, sort all these things out and come away with the truth. And that's what I believe I present today. All right, great, thank you. So with that, let's begin with your 20 minute int introduction, which we can, or, or your opening statement, which we will begin now. In December, 2021, the James Webb Telescope was launched. It is so powerful that it can see galaxies at the edge of the known universe. But what astronomers saw in these galaxies was not very settling at all. Hold on, I just skipped beyond my, <laughs> I'm sorry for this, was not very settling at all, at least if you are an astronomer that believes in the Big Bang Theory, the one surviving theory of origins today that competes with the creation story in Genesis 1. The reason for their consternation was that the Big Bang Theory predicted that the galaxies at the edge of the universe should be in their embryonic form barely recognizable as galaxies. This was predicted because these galaxies would have been the first made by the Big Bang, and since they would be the farthest away from us, their light would take much longer to reach us. And when it, was, and when it reached us, it would be light from 13 billion years ago when these galaxies were just developing. As such, this 13 billion year old light should be showing the early stages of galaxy formation and thus the galaxies at the edge of the universe would be in their embryonic form. But what did the James telescope see? It saw fully formed galaxies all over the universe. So what does the James Webb telescope tell us in the battle between the Big Bang Theory and the Genesis creation story? It tells us that another piece of evidence has been added to the pile that falsifies the Big Bang and verifies Genesis, since Genesis and other books of the Bible teach that the stars and galaxies were created fully formed 
at once in a single day. And that's exactly what we see in the universe today. Not only that, but modern science, according to Albert Einstein's general relativity theory, allows for the light from those fully formed galaxies created on the fourth day to reach Earth on that very day, just as Genesis 1 says. How is this possible? Because according to Einstein, his general relativity theory requires that there be an alternate cosmology that allows the universe to rotate around a fixed Earth as opposed to the one believed today by most people, that is, that the Earth rotates in a fixed universe. In Einstein's relativistic option of having the universe rotate daily around a fixed Earth, the speed of light is not limited to the normal 300,000 kilometers per second that it is in a fixed universe, but can go any speed and the speed will actually increase the farther away the light source is from the Earth. This is because a rotating universe is not an inertial frame, and Einstein's prior limitation to the speed of light at 300,000 kilometers per second only applies to inertial frames. Hence, the light from the fully formed galaxies at the edge of the universe will have no problem reaching the Earth on the fourth day of the Genesis creation. Speaking of light, a problem that has proved most vexing for secularists and theologians alike is that long before the sun, stars, and galaxies are made on the fourth day, Genesis 1 verse 3 insists that there was a first and primary light made on the first day. Everyone knows the refrain, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. But although they know the jingle, few of today's moderns know what to do with it. And since they don't know what to do with it, they eventually conclude that Genesis cannot be interpreted literally. Some religious-minded Big Bang enthusiasts claim that the light on the first day of Genesis could be the light from the purported Big Bang explosion that is said to have occurred 14 billion years ago. But this scenario won't work, of course, because Genesis 1 says the Earth was created before the light. But the Big Bang claims that the explosion came first and then the Earth was formed 8 billion years later. Others claim that because we only see the sun, stars, and galaxies today, then the light of the first day in Genesis 1 is just another name for the sun, stars, and galaxies, so that the sun and stars actually existed on the first day of creation. And if that is true, then Genesis 1 cannot be interpreted literally, and is just a conflation of ideas that ends up being more symbolic poetry than historical prose. The reality is, the light of the first day was not the sun and stars. Scripture insists in many passages that the original light of Genesis 1 verse 3 still exists independent of the sun, moon, and stars. This truth can be seen in such passages as Ecclesiastes 12 verses 1 and 2, which says, Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, before the time of affliction come, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars be darkened. Notice that the light is distinguished from the sun, moon, and stars. Even modern science shows that the great light of Genesis 1 verse 3 still exists. Research done by the National Science Foundation's Optical Infrared Astronomy Laboratory in Arizona and NASA's New Horizons Space Mission was published in Science Magazine in the November 2020 article titled, Scientists Discover Outer Space Isn't Pitch Black After All, unquote. After subtracting out all the light from the stars and the scattered light from the Milky Way, and then subtracting any visible light coming from any galaxies in the universe, the amount of visible light remaining was astounding. In fact, the amount of unsourced light was about equal to all the known sources of light in the cosmos. An early researcher in this project, pod project, Dr. Michael Zemkoff of the Rochester Institute of Technology, said it this way, quote, We have been studying the visible light for 400 years in the universe, and somehow we missed half the light of the universe, unquote. Another study performed by the Goddard Space Flight Center discovered the same unsourced light, which in their own words was, quote, 
a strange background glow seen after peering all the way to the most remote objects in the universe, unquote. Not only can the details of the first and fourth day of Genesis be supported by the findings of modern science, all of the days of Genesis can be supported by modern science. At least the data from modern science that is interpreted correctly and not with an atheistic or anti-religious bias. Of course, modern science wasn't available in the days of Moses or even Augustine or Aquinas, but they believed by faith all the things that were written about the creation in Genesis 1. With few exceptions, all of them believed that the days of Genesis were 24 literal hours long. But about 300 years after Aquinas, things began to change. The first indication that modern man was not going to be satisfied with a literal interpretation of Genesis 1 was when Copernicus published his book, De Revolutionibus, in 1543, claiming that the earth went around the sun, not the sun around the earth. Copernicus had no proof of his heliocentric system, but he thought it would work better than the geocentric system of Ptolemy to maintain an accurate calendar. The Copernicus system is opposed to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, along with about a dozen other passages of scripture, teaches that the sun, stars, and moon revolve around a fixed earth. Then, of course, came Galileo, a century later in the 1600s, who said the same as Copernicus, the earth revolved around the sun. Unlike Copernicus, who was rather shy, Galileo confronted the church head on and claimed that its interpretation of scripture as geocentric was wrong. The Catholic church stood firm against Galileo. Since Galileo could not prove his theory, the church stood by her 1600 year tradition and even condemned heliocentrism as a heresy and Galileo was convicted of being suspected of a, of, a, of a believer in that heresy and sentenced to confinement. But these events were just the brewing of the storm. More important than Copernicus and Galileo was the English scientist Isaac Newton. Newton gave a double whammy to the Catholic Church in his 1697 book, The Principia Mathematica. He became the first person in history to claim to have proof that the earth revolves around the sun. The proof was that because the sun is much bigger than the earth, and we know that the more mass, the more gravity, then the sun's greater gravity will require the earth to revolve around the sun, never vice versa. Second, Newton was the first one to put his ideas into a mathematical equation, and thus his theory could be tested experimentally. The equation was F equals MA, or force equals mass times acceleration. Although we do not have time to get into the details of Newton's theory, the only competition Newton had was perhaps from Aristotle 1300 years earlier, who, if we could put his view of motion into equation, would say F equals MV, or force equals mass times velocity instead of times acceleration. Newton stood out because all the other scientists who came before him had provided only geometric models of the cosmos, with no mathematics, except perhaps trigonometry. But no one had force laws to explain why the planets moved as they did. Since Newton's model of the solar system was superior to anything that had come before it, Newton won the hearts of modern man. He was adulated by the greatest philosopher of the day, Immanuel Kant. Since the Catholic Church had only tradition and scripture, but no scientific knowledge to refute Newton, the Church was no longer held in high esteem by the world. According to the world, the Church had made a big mistake by condemning Galileo, a mistake that showed the true colors of the Church, as just one player on the field like everyone else. And if the church could make one mistake on a matter she considered to be of the faith, so as to convict Galileo of heresy, then what other mistakes would the church make in years to come, on the very faith she claimed to uphold? Moreover, the Bible would never be looked at in the same way, 
Whereas before the Copernican Revolution, everyone could and did interpret the Bible literally. Now hardly anyone wanted to interpret it literally, since it appeared Newton had proven scientifically that the Bible was wrong in saying that the sun and stars literally went around the earth. It was during this tumultuous period for the church and the Bible that the modern world came into its vaunted Enlightenment period, from the late 1600s to the beginning of the 1800s. It was a time following Newton's lead that modern men would use science, not scripture, nor the church, nor the edicts from the magisterium, to decide how the world works. Little did anyone know at the time that exactly 200 years after Newton, a scientist of great repute would come along and challenge almost every aspect of Newtonian physics and give back the geocentric universe to mankind. Although we cannot cover him in detail here, for the record, his name was Ernst Mach, who was born in 1838 and died in 1916. Basically, he said that Newton had no scientific right to claim that the universe was fixed and the Earth rotated inside of it. Mach's new principle led to the whole notion of relativity, which was then later developed by Albert Einstein and which led, as we noted earlier, to the scientific viability of geocentrism by Einstein himself. What we are interested in covering here, however, is what happened during the Enlightenment period long before Ernst Mach and Albert Einstein would reset the scientific world. The Enlightenment, in a word, was fueled by the fact that Newtonian science had, seemingly, proven that the Catholic Church was not infallible and the Bible was not inerrant. If the Bible was not inerrant, that means that it was not inspired by God, because God does not err. And if it was not inspired by God, then it was inspired by fallible men, many of which came from primitive cultures who knew nothing about science. So, modern man developed a whole new field called historical criticism, that would examine the Bible by putting it on the same level as any other famous work of man, such as Shakespeare or Homer. It would be assumed that the Bible, since it and the church held the mistaken notion that the sun went around the earth, was not written by God, only men. The scholars, called historical critics, would then try to find out the real reason why the men who are claimed to have written these biblical books wrote what they wrote. Since the Enlightenment believed there had to be a natural scientific explanation for everything that exists and happens, just as they figured out through Newton and against the Bible that the reality is that the earth revolves around the sun, they believed they could find natural explanations for all the events in the Bible including the Bible's miracles and prophecies. Since we have thousands of Hebrew and Greek manuscripts of the Bible still existing today, describing events that occurred thousands of years ago, then the modern historical critics are forced to give us an explanation of how and why these ancient documents were written, if, as they believe, none of them were inspired by God, as the Bible claims. So, for example, the Bible claims that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament in about a half dozen places. And in them, Moses claims, and the New Testament after him claims, that Moses was inspired by God to write them. The historical critics cannot accept these claims because they don't believe the Bible is inspired, since it errs on basic cosmology. The historical critics then give a natural explanation for why these books were written. The natural explanation is that various Jewish scribes at various times in Israel's history copied the creation stories that were written about 1,500 years before the Israelites existed, which creation stories came from pagan cultures that originated in the Mesopotamian Valley. For example, one of the works that the historical critics claim the Israelites were supposed to have copied was the document Enimo Elish, which speaks of the Babylonian god Marduk who created the world. 
According to the historical critics, particularly the Graf Wellhausen theory, some Jewish writer who was in the Babylonian captivity merely copied the Bab Babylonian creation story, but replaced Marduk with Elohim, the God of Israel. Of course, the problem with this theory is that the earliest extant copy of Enu Mu'elish is from 1200 BC, which is 200 years after Moses, not before Moses. Using this chronology, we then know that it was the Babylonians who copied Moses and replaced Elohim with Marduk, not vice versa. The historical critics also claim that the Jewish writer who copied Enumu Elish and made it into a Jewish story did not do so to give us a blow-by-blow -blow literal description of how Elohim created the world in six days. Instead, they claim that the creation story was written merely to invigorate his Jewish brethren, who, being now released from Babylonian captivity, would enjoy their trip back to Jerusalem knowing that their god, Elohim, was bigger and better than Marduk. In other words, the historical critics claim that it was never the intent of the Jewish writer to give us an exact account of the creation but only to show that Elohim was the greatest god of all the gods because he could make the world out of nothing, while Marduk could only use already existing material to make his world. We will hear this kind of argument over and over again from historical critics. That is, they consistently claim to know the intent of the biblical writers, and that intent was that the writers never meant to give a true and accurate description and chronology of history, but only to influence people to follow the ways of the Hebrews. Of course, to claim to know the intent of the biblical writer means that somehow the historical critic has a clairvoyance to know such matters. But how would he know the intent of the biblical author? He can't. But he needs this gimmick to convince his students that he knows what the biblical writers were thinking. Why? Because in his world of the in the world of the historical critic, supernatural things don't happen. Everything has to have a natural explanation. And if the biblical writer is not really experiencing anything supernatural, yet in his writings he makes it appear as if it is supernatural then the critical scholar surmises that the biblical writer is just making it up as he goes along, otherwise known as fiction. And it was never supernatural in the first place, and thus it must be written naturally and must be explained naturally. This is the school of historical criticism in a nutshell of the view of my opponent, Brendan Kyer. The critical scholar will do the same thing with Old Testament prophecy. In tradition, prophecy means that God inspired the prophet to foretell the future. But the critical scholar doesn't believe such supernatural things can happen. The critical scholar will explain the prophecies of the Old Testament as being made after the fact. That is, the event prophesied already occurred in the past, but to make it look like the prophet was foretelling the future, he will write it in the Bible as if the event occurred after he prophesied it. This is one reason why the historical critics want to push the book of Daniel, which is more than half prophecy, into the 1st or 2nd century BC, instead of the 6th or 7th century when a man named Daniel actually existed. Since Daniel prophesies by name the demise of Babylon, Persia, and Greece that ended in the 3rd century BC, the historical critic says that the only way this can occur naturally is that someone named Daniel can factually write about the demise of these three countries is in the centuries following their demise, not before. As for the miracles, the historical criti critics dismiss the miraculous plagues that the book of Exodus says that God cast upon the Egyptians. The latest natural explanation from the historical critics is that at least nine of the plagues were caused by a fallout of a volcanic eruption, which occurred on the island of Santorini in the south of Greece around 1620 BC. 
as a theory goes, winds would have carried volcanic ash to Egypt at some point over the summer, and the toxic acids in the volcanic ash would have included the mineral cinnabar, which could have been capable of turning the river in Egypt a blood-like red color. Of course, we would ask why the ash only appeared in Egypt and only in one river in Egypt and not in any other country. But let's move on. The accumulated acidity in the water would have caused frogs to leap out and search for clean water. Insects would have burrowed eggs in the bodies of dead animals and human survivors, which generated larvae and then adult insects. The volcanic ash in the atmosphere would have affected the weather with acidic rain landing on people's skin, which in turn caused boils. The grass would have been contaminated, poisoning the animals that ate it. The humidity from the rain and the subs subsequent hail would have created optimal conditions for locusts to thrive. The volcanic ash could also explain the several days of darkness. In the New Testament, the same sort of natural explanations are invented. When Jesus walks on water, it is merely an exaggeration of the biblical writer who saw Jesus walking on shallow water. When Jesus feeds 5,000 people, it is merely an exaggeration of the biblical writer who saw only that the people brought their own lunches. They do the same for every other miracle that Jesus performed in the New Testament. A natural explanation is given to why and how they were written. Although their theory doesn't have a scintilla of evidence to prove it, in order to bolster the theory, they claim that the Gospels were not actually written by men named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but by second-generation Gentile Christians who, without any authorization from the Church, completely redacted the original accounts and loaded them up with miracles and prophecies, as well as anti-Semitic remarks about the Jews. And they finally cap it off by claiming that when Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This proved Jesus was a deluded fool, since his God never came to his rescue. This originated from the doctor humanitarian Albert Schweitzer, who was known all over the world for his good deeds. They tried twice in recent scholarship to get underneath the gospel so that they could retrieve what they called the real Jesus of history. These recent movements were called the historical quest for Jesus. For the record, both movements were a miserable failure. They simply could not separate the historical Jesus from the miracles of Jesus without totally destroying the storyline. In the end, the historical critics who think that the miraculous stories of the Bible are really only fabrications of the fertile minds of ancient superstitious people, are really saying to us that the biblical writers, every single one of them, were lying to us about what really happened in history, and not a one of them was inspired by God to write their histories. The End All right, thank you. So uh, that was 25 minutes. So Brendan, now you have 25 minutes for your opening statement starting now. Uh, do I get cross-examination real quick first? Um, if yeah. if it's okay with Robert, then that would, no. then that would be fine. So, this, so Robert, um, cross-examination would be where statements. he'll just ask you some brief questions and you can give some brief answers just for clarification. So does that sound all right? No. <laughs> that, is, that is, we're just supposed to give opening statements now. And okay, sure. Rebut or cross examine after all that is said and done. Sure. Okay, that's fine then. All right. So your 25 right. minutes begins now. Right. Um, for sharing, sharing my screen. Oh, there it is. Excellent. Give me just a second. I prepared a slideshow for this. Okay. So, uh, the conversation we're talking about today, right, is the question of is traditional age creationism the correct interpretation of Genesis? Um, our little, uh, our uh, extended title includes did the writers of Genesis intend to, to have their narratives uh, taken literally and whether, uh, and did the authorities on scripture uh, throughout the ages uh, interpret Genesis literally? Um, so let's get into it. So the first thing that I want to address is like, what do we mean when we are trying to talk about a correct interpretation, right? 
the idea of a correct interpretation for a book uh, is a little bit more ambiguous than it sounds like at first. Uh, but really what we're trying to go for is, is quite simply, what did the original author or authors intend? Uh, to do this, we are going to look at the literature in context. We are going to explore the authors themselves, and we are going to briefly address later interpretive traditions. So starting off with the author, right? If we want to know what the author meant when an author writes something, it helps us to know who the author is. Unfortunately, the Pentateuch itself doesn't ever actually tell us who wrote it, right? So the book of Genesis belongs to the first five books of the Bible. That, that little section uh, of Hebrew scriptures is known as the Pentateuch. And the Pentateuch uh, contains Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, none of them assert an author. Um, we do have a tradition that comes down that the author is Moses. Um, the tradition is usually built through a few passages later in the Hebrew scriptures, as well as into the Christian New Testament. Um, the ultimate problem with the uh, assertion, however, that this indicates that Moses must have been the author, even that they believe Moses actually was the author, uh, lies in the way that they address other books within the Bible, such as uh, calling the Psalms the Psalms of David, even though a number of them very explicitly say they aren't by David, um, or calling the uh, Song of Songs the Song of Solomon, which is a bit of a later church tradition as well, even though uh, we know by the Hebrew that the Song of Songs was written during the Babylonian period and definitely not during the reign of Solomon himself. So even if the Bible says that it is the, say, law of Moses, uh, that is not the Bible asserting Moses's authorship. But regardless, uh, the Pentateuch itself never gives an author. Uh, but we can, through studying the Pentateuch, not even studying it, just through a simple reading of the book of Genesis, a simple careful reading, we can see that there must have been more than one author. Uh, the current uh, the current main hypothesis is a form of something called the documentary hypothesis, or sometimes the multi-source hypothesis, uh, depending. Um, the documentary hypothesis states that, uh, or the multi-source hypothesis states that, uh, there were between usually four and five different authors, um, or perhaps for authors and later redactors, it depends on which scholars you're reading, but there is agreement in the biblical scholarship that these books had to have been written by more than one author. And they had to have been written by more than one author because it just doesn't make sense otherwise. There are two creation stories, and if we want to take both of them literally, one creation story says that all animals were created uh, split up uh, across two days, depending on where they dwelt, and uh, that man is created kind of last of all. Uh, and another one says all animals are created uh, all at once brought before Adam who names them. So Adam is first and then all animals are created after that. Uh, if we look at the flood narrative, there uh, in one place, the flood narrative says that the flood lasts for 40 days and 40 nights and another lasts for 120 days. Uh, if we look at the story of Joseph, it, it becomes probably the most clear, uh, because if you look at the story of Joseph, there is a point in the story in which uh, Joseph is sold by his brothers to the Midianites, then to the Ishmaelites, then to the Midianites, and then somehow is back in the hands of the Ishmaelites. Uh, that sort of back and forth makes no sense if you read in context. And I'm very quickly and briefly going through, if you go and actually read the stories, you can see that this happens multiple times. There's also a lot of inconsistencies with the use of, for instance, the name of God. And so this caused scholars to say, hey, it looks like there's more than one story here. In fact, it looks like there's two stories specifically because they can split these stories and can very easily see consistency in the two stories between their language. They cross-reference each other. Um, 
it is very clear that there are two separate stories. And then there was at least one other author who came in, compiled them, tried to fix it up a little. And that's how we get to the multiple author hypothesis. Um, it is in absolutely no way a um, question of whether or not the Bible itself was inspired. It is just an acknowledgement that the Bible itself, uh, the claim that Moses is the author is vague and the first five books seem to have more than one author. Um, this, by the way, is a breakdown of the typically explained four different uh, authors. This is kind of the standard uh, explanation within scholarship, although there are some scholars who disagree on this and just kind of how those break down. All right, so it's difficult to figure out the author. We can say um, that based off of some of the language, uh, based off of some of the references, some of the ways that the Hebrew interacts, uh, some of the like Hebrew vocabulary, some of the uh, historical events and things referenced, uh, we could say with uh, a decent level of clarity uh, that the compilation of the books uh, is in the fifth century BCE, although it does seem pretty clear as well that the uh, books themselves start being written before that. All right, so let's talk about the context. Uh, I apologize, my computer is trying to be a little bit weird. There we go. Okay, uh, so let's talk about the context, right? Because the uh, Bible was not written in a vacuum. It was written in the ancient Near East, and it was written by ancient Near Eastern authors. Um, as uh, Robert mentioned, uh, the Enuma uh, Elish is very frequently discussed when we are talking about this topic. Uh, um, Oh, well, that will be a problem. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, the Enuma Elish is very frequently talked about when we talk about this topic, and for good reason. But it is not the only piece of Akkadian literature that we have from that period in time. Uh, and I'll go over a few others. Um, so we know from Akkadian literature that there was a very clear and very common occurrence of uh sharing stories and changing stories we have examples of uh specific myths and specific ideas within the myths uh evolving uh as the uh as different societies rise up uh they will take a myth they will replace the name of whatever god was there with their god sometimes that's all they do we have copies of the enuma Elish, for instance in which the Babylonians, I believe it was, just replaced the name of the god with their god. That's all they did. They just kept the rest of it the same. They just traded the names of the gods out. Uh, we also have examples where uh, some ideas begin to evolve, right? So the earlier creation myths, we have a god fighting Tiamat, the goddess of chaos, uh, related to the uh, Akkadian word for the sea. Um, and then, and it's a battle, and it, he wins, but it definitely is a fight. Then we have an evolution from that to uh, Tiamat, uh, to the battle with Tiamat being nothing. He just instantly overcomes her as, as our god is clearly more powerful than your god was. Uh, and then we have an evolution of that, even to a reference of Tiamat in the beginning of Genesis, where she's not even an actual talking living figure. Um, but given the placement of the word, it's very clear that they are referencing her, right? So we see in ancient Near Eastern literature that there is a commonality. There is a thread of commonality where they will take the myths of the civilizations before them and around them, and they will just take it and change it a little, trade out the names of the gods, and voila, our god is definitely better. It is a theological assertion not a historical assertion. And it seems ex incredibly clear based off of the fact that we literally have texts where they just traded the name out, right? That they knew this was not meant to be taken historically. This is an assertion that our deity is better than the deities that came before because look, he's stronger. Look at the story. So the question then is not... Uh, so much what, well, you know, do we see this in the ancient Near East school? 
wonderful. What does that have to do with the Bible? Well, the Bible was written in the ancient Near East. And so we have to ask ourselves, does the Bible show any signs of this? Do we see any evidence that this is happening, right? If the Bible is uh, strictly from the word of God himself, then we shouldn't, right? Unless the Bible itself predates all of these, but we have absolutely no evidence that it did. And in fact, it makes absolutely no sense for it to, given that some of these predate the invention of the Hebrew language by about 15, eh, 13, 100 years. Um, and the uh, and predate uh, our earliest known examples, even of Proto-Hebrew. And we would be able to tell if there had been the translation work like that, given that the way that they copy these words is so precise. It's very clear that the Hebrew uh, or that, that the Hebrew text did not come uh, before these others. Right. So we start looking right in the Enuma Elish. And I am only going over a few examples so that I can save a little bit of time. Right. But uh, right off the bat, the very opening to the Enuma Elish, which uh, the Enuma Elish was written somewhere between 1800 and 800 BCE. We aren't actually entirely sure, but even the latest date of 800 uh, is still predates the at least compilation of uh, the uh, Pentateuch. Right, so the very opening lines of the Enuma Elish. When the heavens above did not exist and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, there begetter and demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. Sounds eerily similar to Genesis 1.1, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the deep. In fact, by the way, I had mentioned Tiamat connection that we see it here. Demiurge Tiamat, right? Uh, that is connected through the Semitic word Tiham, Tihamat, right? It becomes in the Akkadian Tiamat, the uh, ocean goddess of chaos who is there in the creation stories. And through Hebrew, it becomes the word Tehom, which means sea, right? From the Semitic, the te, uh, Tihamat, that also means sea. Right, so there is a very clear reference in this to this pagan goddess, Tiamat, uh, although she herself clearly has no agency and is not listed as a character. We have a little homage, a little nod to the uh, myths that the biblical story is borrowing from. Um, we can also look to the Epic of Gilgamesh, which predates the, uh, the Enuma Elish, by at least 200 years and predates the compilation of the biblical texts by a good five, uh, sorry, a good uh, over a thousand years, right? The Epic of Gilgamesh. So when we look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, we see more similarities, right? So this is a passage from the Epic of Gilgamesh in which Gilgamesh is talking to a man who survived a flood, right? And this man who survived a flood says, The seventh day when it came, I brought out a dove. I let it loose. Off went the dove, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so back it came to me. I brought out a swallow. I let it loose. Off went the swallow, but then it returned. There was no place to land, so it came back to me. I brought out a raven. I let it loose. Off went the raven. It saw the waters receding, finding food, bowing and bobbing. It did not come back to me. Sounds again incredibly similar to the creation or sorry to the flood narrative in genesis now an apologist could look at this and go yeah if the flood occurred then obviously you would have people telling this story and the story would get passed down which would work a lot better if not for the fact that uh is my slide going to work um Yes, I, I should have shifted the uh, order of these, but if not for the fact that, once again, the Epic of Gilgamesh predates the writing of the biblical text, but also uh, a little bit after the writing of the Epic of Gilgamesh, we have another uh, ancient Near Eastern manuscript called the uh, Aridu Genesis. And the Aridu Genesis also describes this flood in a little bit more detail, right, saying, all the evil winds, all stormy winds gathered into one, and with them the flood was sweeping over the cities of the half-bushel baskets for seven days and seven nights after the flood had swept over the country. 
After the evil wind had tossed the big boat about on the great waters, the sun came out spreading light over heaven and earth. Seven days and seven nights. When we compare this to the Epic of Gilgamesh, when we compare this to some of the other flood narratives from the region, first of all, all of them give very different. I am illustrating some of the similarities so that you can see how these stories connect. But all of them are incredibly different on things like the reasons why the flood occurs. And one of these myths, the flood occurs because humans were noisy and the gods got upset. So they wiped them out. One of them survives in a boat. The gods realize, wait a second, we kind of need sacrifices to, you know, keep going. We kind of like them. And we just killed all of our sacrificers. Wait, guy in the boat, he's still alive. Excellent. We can use him. Um, right. And those sorts, like the reasoning behind the flood, the details around the flood, very diff uh, vastly. But we can see a clear evolution. The days of the flood start to become more. The details of things like the boats and the animals start to become more. Um, we get some more detail here and there. In fact, we actually get more detail the closer we start to get to the biblical texts. Um, we also have a reference to the flood in the Sumerian king list, which predates even the Epic of Gilgamesh. In 2125 BC, circa 2125 BC, uh, sorry, BCE, um, and I mentioned a couple of passages here from version G, but there are a number of versions of this that we have. The first is, uh, after the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridu. In Eridu, Alulim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Alolga ruled for 36,000 years. Two kings, they ruled for 64,800 years, right? Illustrating the incredibly long lives of these Sumerian kings. Um, this passage, though, here, lines 19 through 23, we see five cities, eight kings ruled for 385,200 years. Then the flood swept over. After the flood swept over and the kingship had descended from heaven, the kingship was in Kis. In Kis, Giser became king. He ruled for 1,200 years. Kalasina Bel ruled for 900 years. Right? So we have incredibly long lifespans of these individuals, which is similar to the genealogies we see in Genesis, but exaggerated to the point of absurdity. We have a reference to the flood that then is immediately followed by, and then after the flood passed, then the kingship continued. Uh, we have, uh, and this predates any of the others. So we have this, then we have the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a clear work of fiction. It, it, it knows that it's a work of fiction. And then from this little reference that there was a flood and the Epic of Gilgamesh, which does its best to name drop some of these kings and bring in the Sumerian king list. Then we get the uh, Genesis, um, the other Genesis account that I uh, mentioned, uh, this one, um, the Eridu Genesis account. Uh, and then after the Eridu Genesis account, we get into uh, the Genesis that we have. Um, which again, very clearly split into two different stories. So even then we have two different accounts that are being, um, that are being uh, condensed into one, uh, giving us our modern interpretation, or sorry, our modern uh, collection in the Pentateuch. Right, so uh, these are just the ones from Genesis. Our prompt was very specifically on Genesis. Um, there are more that I could talk about in the book of Genesis. Uh, there's significantly more. Uh, I could have spent all 20 minutes just breaking down any one of these stories into their constituent parts. Uh, there has been much research that's been done on why the individual books of uh, the Pentateuch uh, clearly did not have a single author. Uh, and that itself could be an entire course uh, there is so much I could have gotten to in just Genesis, but um, it also doesn't just stop in Genesis, right? When we go into the rest of the uh, the Pentateuch, right? So uh, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, we see other similarities, right? We know that uh, Sargon of Akkad predated Moses for sure, um, which, by the way, uh, all of the uh, examples that I've given have predated Moses. 
So at best, Moses himself would have been after all of these stories. Um, But we see in, for instance, the birth of Moses, it is almost word for word the story of the birth of the King Sargon of Akkad, who predates Moses by a significant margin, right? That is not something that you can try and claim, well, they all experienced the flood and those stories were passed down orally. Yes, if those stories of Sargon were passed down orally, (laughs) then they become the, uh, or they get incorporated into the story of Moses. You cannot claim then that literarily Moses came first because that's not how those states work and that's not contested. We see in Deuteronomy 32 verses seven through nine, Uh, The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls confirmed what scholars had suspected. We see very clear uh, references to polytheism. Um, When uh, El Elyon uh, numbered the, uh, and I'm quoting imperfectly, but uh, El Elyon numbered the, or divided up the world according to the number of the sons of gods, which is an ancient Near Eastern phrase, meaning the other deities. And if you doubt that, then, well, the passage explains itself right after that. He divided the world up to the number of the sons of gods, and he gave Yahweh his portion, and his portion was Israel, right? The implication being there that he gave the other gods their portions as well. Uh, we see very clear parallels between the ancient Near Eastern law codes and the biblical law codes, in some cases so clear that they are uh, in conversation with each other. And again, the ancient Near Eastern law codes, the Code of Hammurabi, some of the Hittite law codes predate Moses. Um, archaeology uh, supports the idea that these books uh, should not be taken literally. Uh, again, I could spend a whole hour lecture talking just about the archaeology. I could go further than that, right? Um, getting into the archaeology of things like the the uh, the Exodus account and, and uh, what archaeology says about that, what archaeology says about the conquest of Canaan. Um, the short version is that uh, archaeology has not only failed to find any evidence for those, but it has found evidence. And the evidence is clear that those things did not happen according to the account laid forth in the Pentateuch. Um, we have examples of things like the Amarna letters, where we have very clearly detailed uh, the comings and goings in and out of Egypt that gives us a good idea of uh, how Egypt operated during the periods in question. So in conclusion, uh, these are not, this is not a conversation, right, about some people trying to find ways to undermine the Bible. In fact, some of these things were developed by people who absolutely came into it kicking and screaming because the evidence and data supported this and not because they had an agenda. Uh, If the Bible is inerrant, then we should see evidence that it's inerrant and it should stand up to basic scrutiny. Uh, If scholars approach the Bible in the way that they approach any other piece of literature, right, without special pleading, and they find that it does not stand up to the same basic level of scrutiny, then we have to question whether or not we should be taking this as an inerrant piece of literature, or whether we should be taking this perhaps for its theological implications, but not as a historical text. Um, And with that, uh, I appreciate you listening. I look forward to the conversation. Okay, so let me um, try to hit as many spots as I can, because there's about 20 of them here I wrote down. Um, Okay, so uh, you made one claim that the Pentateuch doesn't tell us who the author is. Well, let me let me turn to uh, Deuteronomy 3124, which says, then the Lord gave this command to Joshua, the son of Nun, be strong, be courageous. After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end, he gave this command to the Levites, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now that's just one of about half a dozen passages in um, the the, uh, Pentateuch. And this comes at the last book of the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy. Okay. Um, Does Is anything about that specifically say that it is the book? book of deuteronomy that we're reading 
that you wrote down or is it vague with uh, this book or sorry um because what i'm reading here is uh after fin- uh, after moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end um that wouldn't then mean that the book of Deuteronomy is specifically from Moses. It could still have been that he wrote the, that law down and that that law wasn't incorporated into later manuscripts. Well, yeah, and that doesn't make a claim about the Pentateuch being from Moses. Well, it says from beginning to end. It says the law. Well, that's, God had just finished that's giving another name for the Pentateuch. God had just finished giving laws to Moses and Moses wrote those laws down. Yeah. There's nothing in there that's, and, and in fact, the uh, book of Genesis doesn't contain any of the laws. So Moses no, wouldn't have written You're talking about two different things. You're talking about the Ten Commandments as opposed to the law and the prophets, which is the phraseology that's used to refer to the Old Testament plus the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, so-and-so. So the yeah, word but, law, but when does that it, phraseology start? It starts because right here. It starts right here in Deuteronomy. It the starts right there because you want it to start right there. There's no, nothing says, right there. It that, says from beginning to end. Okay. Yeah, it says this law. It doesn't say anything about the rest of and the book. I just said that, that the word law refers to the whole Pentateuch because that's the way it's used in the rest of the Bible. And, and uh, that's, that's the way it begins to be used later in Judaism. It's not necessarily the way that's used right here. You can't anachronistically look at uh, passages from... Presumably, you know, hundreds of years later um, and say, well, they say, you know, the law, of the prophets and the writings. Therefore, when this says this law, which doesn't say the law, which would be a definitive article that would then indicate that it's potentially trying to refer to itself. It says this law specifically. Uh, well, which law are you referring to then? Which law is Moses to, writing? To the law that had just been given. Yeah, but you're, uh, you're the one who just told us that Moses didn't write any of those laws. Oh, absolutely. Yes, that's a different argument. My So my issue here is that, like, to start, this passage doesn't indicate that Moses wrote the whole of the Pentateuch. Yeah. And then on top of that, I would also argue that Moses himself didn't write any of the Pentateuch, but that's a separate argument. My point is that— Yeah, but it's an argument that passage, contradicts itself. Okay, you can't say that Moses didn't write any of the Pentateuch and then say that Moses wrote specific laws in with this verse that I just read, which is uh, I no, but I can say that your own uh, your own uh, framework here is not consistent. That's what uh, I'm let, pointing out. Say your framework is not consistent. Let's, let's move on, okay? Because we, we have a lot of points to cover. Um, you said that the um, the uh, Mesopotamian cultures all copied each other yes. in their Babylonian literature, sometimes replace names, sometimes replace whole sections, blah, 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 blah. I, I don't know if you realize, but you're proving my point that these cultures were in common practice copying each other's works. So to, to so that means that it's very possible that they copied the Genesis story, just like they copy everybody else's stories, okay? But we don't have any indication, except your theory, that the Jews copied from the Mesopotamians, okay? There's no not true. In, the, in the Pentateuch that says that. There's no uh, in the entire Bible that says that. Yeah, so here's the thing. You can't necessarily just try, like, you... If you're wanting to, say, date a book of literature, yes, you can take clues from inside the book, which there are, um, but you also have to look at the broader context, right? So even something as simple as the fact that the Pentateuch was written in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew wasn't a language during the period of the Akkadians in which some of these things were being written. Proto-Hebrew um, or Paleo-Hebrew, I always get the two words mixed up, uh, wasn't even around yet, right? And so we would see... Like to, to have specific references to the same wording, to have specific references to the same ideas um, in Hebrew, which is a later language significantly than the original writing, indicates that it was not copied from an original uh, biblical source, but that they copied from the earlier source because of the wording. Um, not to mention, well, again, you can't that, prove that Hebrew was that late. There's no proof of that whatsoever. 
And second of all, you give a dating for Enumu Elish between 1800 BC and 800 BC. That's yes. a thousand years. Mm -hmm. That's quite convenient because then you go to the 800 BC day and you see this was much later than when Moses was, was writing the uh, Pentateuch or, or, or would have been writing the Pentateuch. And so, wow, what an arbitrary uh, uh, dating system you have. 1800 to 800. Wow, I could I could work a lot of miracles with that kind of dating. The yeah, that's why is, I started that, with wait, the wait, wait, just one more point. Yes, the go ahead. The, the, ex, the only extant copy we have of Enumu Elish is from 1200 BC. That's it. So you can't go back to 800, 1800 to say, well, theoretically, Enumu Elish existed from 1800 all the way to 800 BC. No, because you have no ex extant copies of it from 1800. You're just making a theory so that you can cover all the bases, basically. Um, no, I'm, I'm definitely not. Number one, I'm not making a theory. I am quoting the range that scholars are, are debating from the research I was able to do. Um, I also start with the Enuma Elish because, yes, the fact that there is such a range on the dates does make it uh, weaker for the argument overall. And I like to present my weakest points first and then build to the stronger points. Um, as far as the range of dating 1800 to 800, um, I mean, 800 is still before most scholars would place the compilation of the uh, of the Pentateuch, although it is after several of the uh, book or several of the pieces are, are believed to have been written. Uh, but again, the reason I put it first was not to try and pull a fast. In fact, I didn't, didn't make any specific point about the Enuma Elisha's date other than the 800 is before the scholarly uh, thoughts okay. on the compilation. Can I go on to the next question? Uh, if I can finish my sentence. Um, oh, okay. Yes. Uh, the point was to show a very clear uh, indication that these texts are in conversation with each other. And then after that, I go to the texts that are in conversation with the Enuma Elish and Genesis that are um, undebatably earlier. Okay, so you say that um, you went through the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, Irudu Genesis, Sumerian King List, blah, 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 and you gave their dates. 2000 BC for the Gilgamesh, 1600 BC for Eridu, and 2125 for Sumerian king list. Okay, so um, according to the Pentateuch, the flood occurred before all those events. The flood occurred at about 2500 BC. Sure. Okay, so that was the original according to the Pentateuch, and we can know this by going through the genealogy just backwards. Yep. Okay, so if all yours are coming after the actual flood, how can you claim that these are the originals and the Genesis story just copied from them? For the aforementioned reasons, uh, linguistically uh, using other pieces of evidence within the text, right? So uh, like I addressed that specifically in my opening uh, argument, right? Number one, linguistically, Hebrew wasn't around. Like we know Hebrew evolved from, pro, uh, from Proto-Hebrew um, we don't have any evidence that Hebrew existed as an alphabet before that, and plenty of evidence that it didn't. Um, well, right. So you see, we don't need Proto-Hebrew because the Pentateuch written in ancient Hebrew after yes. the Proto-Hebrew. Yes. That's because it was written around 1400 to 1407 uh, or something like that. Okay. With Deuteronomy, because they were just going into the land of Canaan, which, uh, now, I know our dates may be off, but mine are 1400, so I, I don't need to have the Proto-Hebrew mess things up, if you know what I mean. Right. But again, linguistically, then that just doesn't work. I, I mean, I could also point to the fact I, I don't that there's... I what you mean by that. Linguistically, it doesn't work. What, what, what I mean, you... yeah, the, the aforementioned points, uh, but but the a little bit more clear, perhaps, in, in trying to date the uh, the Pentateuch. Uh, the Pentateuch makes reference to things like now the Canaanites were then in the land, right? Implying that it's being written when the Canaanites are no longer in the land. It makes reference to things like now there was no, uh, there was not yet any king in Israel making right, reference to the idea of that. What, what does that mean? There was no Canaanites in the land. What are you trying to make of that argument? What I'm trying to make is that the book itself dates itself after this period, right? It is making... Like it makes its own little like fun little comments about how 
you know, uh, just so all of you readers know, the Canaanites were still in the land, right? So that implies that it was written when the Canaanites were not in the land. Otherwise, you don't need to explain that. They no, don't need that's to. not true. That's not true. In Genesis 15, when God says that, uh, gives, a, gives a promise to Abraham and says, your seed shall inherit the land of Canaan. And he gives all the names of the of the nations there that they will inherit. He says, the Canaanite is in the land, but you can't go there yet because the, the iniquity is not full yet. When it's full, and that would be 400 years later, I will send you. And the Canaanites are there 400 years later and they slaughter them. Okay. Yes. So, so, it, so it at no least had to. Have, no, no, but then it at least had to have been written not during the time of Moses, but during the time of, uh, or like after the time of Joshua, when they push in and drive the Canaanites out. Uh, and that's why it's going to take somebody who is inspired to write past history because he wasn't there. Moses wasn't there. So how is he going to know what occurred in Abraham's time when God gave the promise, or in Joshua's time? Uh, yeah, that, I'm, that's not what I'm asserting. What I'm asserting is not about past. It's about the future. It's about the fact that when Moses was alive, he wouldn't have written, now this is when the Canaanites were still in the land, as if they were no longer in the land. He wouldn't have written, now this was when there was still no king in Egypt. I'm well, sorry, in, in, in Israel. I don't, I, I don't know if I'm getting across to you. They were still in the land because they need to be conquered. And so Joshua goes in and conquers them. So I don't see the contradiction. Because when you say something like, now this is when they were, it would be like uh, somebody coming into, say, the U.S. colonies and writing about settling in the U.S. and going, oh, and by the way, um, you know, this is when uh, the Native Americans are still in the land, right? You would look at that and you would go, wait, what? why would you say that? Like, you would only say something like that if you have, or if you're looking back from a point where, they're no longer in the land, right? Otherwise, no, well, obviously, hard. they're still in the land. We're looking at them. We're, we're here, right? Same thing with the king uh, saying that, you know, now there was not yet any king in Israel. Well, that is a very odd thing to say unless you know that at some point there will be a king in Israel. And, well, there's no, no reason. Not for necessarily, because they were clamoring for a king like all the other nations, and God wouldn't let them have one. And then finally he gave in and said, okay, you can have a king. Yeah, they were clamoring for a king after the judges. They are clamoring for a king in the book of Samuel, which is significantly okay, so the notion after. the king was already there. You're, you're making the argument that they didn't have a notion of king until after the fact somehow. But they no, did. I'm saying that they didn't have a notion of the king until it, within the biblical timeline. They don't have a notion of the king until after the book of Judges, All right, which is well next? after Moses. All right, let me go on to the next um, issue here. Sure. Um, you said, if, I, if I'm if quoting you correctly, that if the Bible is inspired, then there is no need or there is no mixing of the Jewish story with the Babylonian stories. Did I hear you correctly? No, uh, and this is one of the reasons I had wanted to, to be able to do the cross-examination. Um, the word saying that the Bible is inspired is vague and means different things to different people, right? So, like, I don't think you'd find any Christian who would say that the Bible wasn't inspired, but they would have different ways that they understand that. And I wanted to clarify with you specifically what you meant by inspired. And I try to be very careful with my language around that because uh, – it's very possible to believe that the Bible was inspired and also that it borrowed from the uh, kingdoms around it, from previous stories to craft its own narrative for a founding of... Uh, and would that Israel. crafting be inspired if you believed in inspiration? Yes, depending on your definition of inspiration. Like, that, that, right, that's well, kind of my point. This, is, this whole, this whole uh, resolution was the traditional age view of creation yeah. Tra the traditional age view of inspiration is that god moved it moved in such a way where his words are what's written on the page that moses wrote except he's using Mo moses's vocabulary in other words god had a direct uh action 
into the mind of Moses to write words that are inspired by God so that they do not err. That's the traditional view of inspiration. It's one of the traditional views of inspiration. No, there is uh, no other. There is no other. You, can you name another one? Yeah, that uh, God specifically influenced the writing, just specifically to make theological points. Uh, there's no, also no, that's a modern view. That's not the traditional view. I would agree with one you. Of that's the, the modern modern view so of traditionalism, but not traditional yeah, so view. If I had more time, I would have gotten into this. Um, there is no traditional view, right? Like the one of the main elements of Judaism is a constant uh, debate over interpretation of uh, their biblical texts. Like we see that even in the pages of scripture in the New Testament, uh, right? Meaning that at the very least, you know, it predates the coming of the New Testament. We see that in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, yeah, as far back as we can see Judaism, they are debating the correct ways to interpret uh, scriptures. Uh, and while it's difficult for us to tell what, say, the ancient uh, Hebrew people uh, and then Jewish people, uh, how all of them interpreted or how individual groups interpreted things like Genesis, um, based off of just the fact that we just have so few sources, the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem and the library there in 70 AD really hurt that. Uh, some of the earliest, even church fathers that we see that is not their view, right? Augustine is, is very what clear. Is not their view? What is not their view? Uh, that the the interpretation of inspiration means that uh, God is directly giving the words to Moses or through Moses' uh, writing that they're right and that like every bit of it then is completely 100% historically reliable, right? Augustine didn't believe that the creation of the uh of uh, the, the, the creation narrative was trying to describe it, how it actually happened augustine uh you're, you're, you see, what you're doing places. if i can interrupt you is you're mixing and matching augustine's interpretation of inspiration was exactly what i told you when he came to genesis one he had a hard time interpreting it literally because he didn't have all the information and so he said well some of this is spiritual but he still believed it was the very words of God that he was interpreting, whether it was literal or spiritual. Right. And I'm saying that that is a, is an interpretation. Uh, it's okay. not the interpretation. I, okay. I mean, can I ask you another question? Yeah, go for it. All right. So in the beginning, you talked about the correct interpretation and what you need is what the author intended to write. And as you know, in my opening statement, I made a big deal of that issue. And the reason I did was because this seems to be the key of the sort of um, hermeneutic that you guys are using, wherein you have some kind of mystical, clairvoyant way of determining what the intent of the biblical author was, and then once you use that as a premise, then you go on to conclude that, well, he didn't intend to write history. Okay? I don't think you can do that. You can't assume that you know what the intent of that writer was. How would you know to oh, then uh, claim that it's not writing history? Yeah. We we can figure intent out through the study of literature, like, you don't pick up a scientific article, read it, and then walk away going, man, I, I don't know if the intent of this author was to try and give me some, like, actual science or whether the intent of this author is science fiction. Like, you don't do that. Oh, you read course. a scientific article and you go, hey, this has all of the trappings of a specific genre. I agree on that count. If, that if the guy in, his, in the top of his article saying, I'm, I'm writing a scientific article, and you, he's got a PhD in physics, so you know he's a scientist. And all the other articles that he's written are written with by science. Okay, yeah, yeah. you know where the guy's coming from. But right. these are people you don't know. These are people that are claiming to write history, and yet you say, no, they're not writing history. 
They're just uh, something from somebody else. How would you know that? that actually, that specifically, I'm saying they're not claiming to write history. Uh, and I would know that for the same reason that you can ascertain that a scientific article is meant to be taken as scientific literature. You look at the genre, right? So if we have very clear examples of these same stories throughout the same region, using a lot of the same language, using a lot of the same ideas, and we know from those examples that uh, those were not taken as literal history, those are not meant to be literal history, then when we see another book come along with the same literature, the same verbiage, the same ideas, the same themes, this, right, fitting very clearly within the same genre, it would just be really, really strange. Sure, maybe, maybe they do mean for that to be the one example of this that is meant to be taken literally, but that would be really strange. It would be similar to like... Why would it be strange? I mean, it seems this, more likely to me that you have an original text that gives the actual history and the other nations are like saying, Hey, well, we need a creation story too. So they copy from this original that gives the proper history and they make up things as they go along to fit in their gods and twist it here, twist it there to fit in with their culture. I can see that as a logical progression, but I can't. These so so the, the question then here that I'd be curious about, right, because you've been claiming that this was written by Moses. Yeah. Some of the texts that I referenced predate Moses, right? So e even if I say, sure, we'll, we'll let's pretend that, Moses yeah, wrote it. I already explained that to you. I already explained to you that Moses was inspired to write this in 1400 or so BC, and he gets this knowledge because it, somebody's telling him what occurred in the past. And that's how he knows its history. And then coincidentally, he uses same verbiage. He no, no, uses no. references. No. They're using uses... the same verbiage that Moses used. That's my No, 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 they predate Moses. No, no, they don't predate Moses because if Moses is inspired in twenty five in 1400 to talk about the flood that occurred in 2500 and the Gilgamesh epic, the Eridu and the Sumerian kings all come after 2500, then I've proved my point because they're the ones that are copying from what occurred in 2500 BC. No, no. So you're, you're not, I think, understanding this point. If, if I'm writing about current events, right, and you write about current events, yeah, you and I are both going to have similar stories. But if you then, if I'm writing about current events, you're writing about current events. And then when you look at mine, I write about it the exact same way that you do. And I borrow like analogies that you use and I make reference to your story. You're not going to look at that and go, well, they're just both writing about current events. You're going to go, oh, okay. That guy very clearly had some access to uh, Robert's version of this story and was borrowing from that and using that. It's sure. not just about the fact that they're using, uh, that they're talking about like the same events. It's about the fact that they are quoting each other and referencing each other and that the biblical account is quoting and referencing things that came before it. No, it's, that you can't it, prove that. You see, you I can't prove assuming that. Hold on, you, I can't you prove keep that. Assuming that because the Gilgamesh epic comes in 2000 BC and mm -hmm. predates Moses' writing of the Pentateuch, that that somehow makes Moses a later writer that's copying from the Gilgamesh epic. You can't prove that. Could I jump in and just yeah. make one comment? It yeah. can be deducted from our time, if that's okay with Robert. No, go um, ahead, Hugh. I want you yeah. to do whatever you can. So the, the, I just wanted to make the point that um, Robert's absolutely correct, of course, that the the fathers of the church call Moses the prophet of the past. So, for example, he's able to describe how God created the world because God shows him exactly how he did it. And it's the revelation is very different from the pagan sources that you quoted. But what you also need to take into account, and on our website we have an article by Mike Gladier, which documents this in great detail. There are many places in Genesis 
where we read, these are the generations of so-and-so. And he makes an overwhelming case that these are sections which are contain information that was probably written on clay tablets. And these were handed down from the patriarchs and given to Moses. So it's not either Moses had a prophetic knowledge of all these events in the past, or Moses relied entirely on records that were handed down, because both are attested to in the tradition. And that firmly supports Robert's thesis that the information was handed down to Moses, that information that he was not given through divine revelation, in a form that God had protected, but which was handed down by the different patriarchs who preceded him, and who therefore had original knowledge of the events that they recorded, which predated the sources that you mentioned, which are all post-flood. Yeah, they were called the Toledoths. Have you ever heard that term, um, Brendan? Uh, probably at some point, but it's not ringing a bell right now. Um, so the theory but, is, and, let's just recap so you can respond to it, is that Adam had a Toledoth where he wrote down what happened. And then after that, Seth, who was the next in the chronological genealogy, he wrote down what happened on clay tab, and they carried these with them wherever they went. So we had a whole history that was written down. And then when Moses came to write it in 1400 BC, he was inspired by God to take from those clay tablets what God wanted in the Pentateuch. Okay. Um, I can't really do much to refute that because we don't have any of the clay tablets. And so I'm just going to okay. point out that this is an argument from silence. This is saying that, well, this is plausible. Uh, sure, there's lots of things that are plausible. We don't see any evidence that it happens. And Well, the other we point don't... that Hugh made that you can comment on is that where would Moses or anybody get information about the past if they weren't there? There's lots of places you can get information out of the past. You can go and read the the sources around you that are claiming to have, or you know that oh, let me, let have me myths about the past. And then if you did that, you would probably copy pieces of that. Before the creation, whether it's Timut or anybody else, before the creation, sure. there's nobody except the Creator. So how would a person who is thousands or so years beyond that creation? know what the creator did if he wasn't there watching the creator do it oh yeah the only way that they would be able to know is if the creator or some other immortal being told them told them okay all right yeah. so you understand that let me ask you a personal question about genesis 1 the puzzling thing that has made a lot of scholars who want to be faithful to the bible stumble is that we got these two lights we have the one light in the beginning Okay, and then we have these other celestial lights on the fourth day. And they're saying that, well, you know, come on, we only see the sun, galaxies, and the stars. Where is this other light coming from? Um, does that bother you that Genesis has these two light sources that are different? One is there for three days and then is gone and then is replaced by the sun, moon, and stars. Does that bother you at all? Not the slightest. Um for one, for the scope of this debate, I'm not really interested in the like physics or science, like scientific side of it, because that there are other debates that I've done and will be doing for those. Um, so just as a literary device, no, not not in the slightest. Doesn't doesn't. Uh, and that was one of the things I wanted to when we get to my notes. Um, since I I think you still have a few more points, but when we get to my uh, notes from your opening statement, one of the things I wanted to mention is that man. I, I'd be able to feed a lot of horses with the amount of straw from the straw men that you built of what scholars are saying. Uh, you picked and chose in your opening statement from things that uh, are scholarly consensus and things that were called scholarly consensus or were asserted by scholars but have been worked through with better scholarship and better information and things that 
random people have stated and you kind of weaved it all together as if that's like what we think in scholarship or what I hold to. Um, you don't have to give and me a lot of it's just not true. Like, no, like the, the idea of trying to naturalize pieces of the story, just it's not really done in scholarship anymore. Like scholarship at this point is, is much more interested in like literary genre, literary conventions. Um, we don't have to like come up with a natural explanation, for instance, of the plagues in Egypt if there's no archaeological evidence for the plagues in Egypt and you don't think it happened. You know, it's, it's a literary device. It's not a, a archaeological. It's not a historical. But you end up in the same right. place, basically. You end up saying that Exodus is not real history. Uh, yeah, it's, absolutely. So what, what is Exodus written for then? Exodus is written for the same reason we get something like the Iliad or the Aeneid. It's written to give the uh, Hebrew people a, a an origin story. Uh, the, a fake uh, origin we, story? Absolutely. Is that, that going to be satisfactory to them? That they know is not... I, I mean, number one, uh, how are they going to go and confirm or deny the details as to whether or not it's a true or well, fake wait a minute. You said to give, you. I asked you the purpose. You said to give the Israelites a history. Yeah. Or Absolutely. somebody's giving it to them, right? So that yeah. person giving it to them knows it is giving them something false that never yes. occurred. So how yeah. is that going to benefit them? Uh, two ways. Uh, the first is a unifying myth. We have these in America, right? Like the story of George Washington cutting down the cherry tree is a unifying myth. Didn't happen. It was made up. But it's a unifying myth around which we can gather because it gives some sort of like character of similarity between uh you know what we want to be as good proud americans who always tell the truth and one of our like historical characters so they use pieces of history um and there is very likely uh there are very likely like actual pieces of history in the narrative as well right like we know of Canaanite slaves escaping Egypt and taking essentially the same route that we see in the Exodus. Um, it's like five of them, but we know of slaves escaping Egypt and taking that route. We have letters, uh, the letters from Marna detail things like that, right? So, yeah, but, uh, answer, answer my question if you would. I understand the analogy to George Washington. Yeah, well, you're you're you reached the point where you would say, okay, yeah, we got a couple of myths around, hanging around here. We got to get rid of, but the U.S. Constitution is not a myth. The Articles of Confederation are not a myth. These are actual realities that these people experienced, wrote them down, and said these are what we're going to go by. There are no myths there. So if you're giving these people myths in Israel to live by, and there's no truth at all to the Exodus. There's nothing there for them to, to hang their hat on and say, yeah, God did this for us, and we should be doing this and that and the other thing. You're just giving them a lie and hoping for the best, basically, is what you're doing. If I could just um, add one other point, and again, please deduct it from our time. I, I'd just like to point out one thing that I think is really um a decisive confirmation of Robert's thesis and a definite kind of death blow to uh, Brendan's thesis. And that is that in the pagan creation myths, because they were all idolaters, the moon and the sun have names because they're worshiped. Genesis is absolutely unique because it speaks of the light that rules the day and the lesser light that rules the night. If, as you are asserting, Genesis came after the pagan myths, this is really hard to explain. Mm -hmm. It is much easier to explain if we accept the constant tradition of the Jewish and Christian peoples that Genesis was the original, because as God reveals the creation of the sun and the moon, he simply reveals them as what they are in creation. There is no hint of any kind of idolatry. So I just wanted to 
at that point. That's great. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll take these two points one at a time. First of all, um, we know that the Iliad and the Odyssey develop the same way. They're giving the Greeks an origin. We know for a fact that the Aeneid developed that way because we have that recorded when talking about Caesar Augustus. They didn't look at these and just go, oh, oh, this is just myths. These are lies. We're just throwing them out. Like they're written as a means to unify the people, emphasize certain characteristics. We know from, uh, I mean, a, a great example is that I already gave in the talk, right? Is that like when the, oh, I'm going to mix these up. Um, I believe it's when the Babylonians took over. Um, there's a point in which they are looking at the creation myth of the people they conquered. And they're using it for a while, and then eventually they actually just replace the name of the god from the people they conquered with the name of their god. Uh, I, I, you could ask the same question of them, but we know that they did it. We know that they uh, tied their identities to these stories. We know that they invented these mm. mythologies. They put together these stories that are meant to be origin stories for their people that the people who are writing it know aren't true. Like they know they're not getting uh, that one's the most explicit because not only do they know that they're not, you know, getting it from a divine source, they're literally just replacing just really the name of the deity with their own, thus hijacking the story to give themselves an origin myth that they stole from someone else. Um, as far as the uh, the fact that the sun and moon aren't stated as deities, that's not a death knell at all. Um, for a few reasons, the first of which is, yeah, religion evolves over time, right? Like that's been one of the things that we uh, that I that I stated, right? Like even the creation myths of the ancient Near East, it starts with the main deity fighting Tiamat, and it's like an equal battle. It's it's an actual like fight, and then it evolves to like the deity shows up and just tells Tiamat, "Hey, I win," and he wins because Tiamat's the lesson, right? So the idea of then stepping into like stepping that next step and going. You know, our God's so powerful that uh, he's not rivaled at all. Like the these figures aren't even actual figures. Isn't an illogical progression. Um, <clears throat> but also that very much fits into the uh, the idea of the multiple sources that are compiled by a um, an editor who goes through, compiles the sources together and then kind of edits and smooths uh, some of it over, right? Like we see, for instance, in pieces of the Pentateuch, references that at least pieces of the Pentateuch were originally polytheistic. There are references to the fact that there are other deities um, of which Yahweh is one of them. Um, and then that gets gradually edited out through a combination of, well, I, like we know that, for instance, like the Masoretic text edits that out. We know that the Septuagint edits it to a lesser form. Uh, we know that because we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, it would be kind of odd to then assume that that just didn't happen, especially like if you're accepting, like it, it, under the documentary hypothesis, yeah, the idea that the final form that we have is attempting to assert some level of monotheism uh, by downplaying the other deities and not naming them or giving them more uh, natural uh, names instead of, you know, deific names. Yeah, that's that's not outside the purview of the documentary hypothesis. And in fact, it fits it quite nicely and seems to fit the data we have. Let me respond to your claim that uh, Deuteronomy 32, 7 to 9 is talking about polytheism. Okay, you claim to get these from the from this passage from the Dead Sea Scrolls that it's talking about God recognizing other gods. Well, first of all, the Dead Sea Scrolls don't claim to be inspired. Okay. Um, second of all, uh, the Hebrew of Deuteronomy 32, 7 to 9 mentions nothing about other gods okay so your claim then is that well what happened was the dead sea scroll version was the original and then the hebrews came along and took out the polytheism of that passage and now that's why the hebrew doesn't have anything about polytheism in that very passage this no i don't say that I, I, I don't say the hebrews did that i say that the masoretic text did that 
well, we do the also Hebrew see text? it edited in that's the, 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 the Masoretic text. Is the is the extant Hebrew uh, of the old of the Old Testament that we have? That's it from okay. the Middle Ages. And that's not it. We no, also have the Septuagint, which is in Greek, which was translated from the Hebrew. And we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are uh, Hebrew copies of books of are the Old Testament. Saying, are you saying that the Septuagint talks about polytheism in Deuteronomy 32, 7 to 9? No. So it's actually really interesting what the Septuagint does. So the, the passage, the way that the passage appears in the Masoretic text, it says the children of Israel, right? That he divided the land up according to the number of the children of Israel. The Septuagint says, according to the number of the angels, which is weird. And so scholars before the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered were looking at that passage and going, this is a really weird incon uh, incongruity between these two texts. It seems like there would have been, like, it seems like they are trying to handle a something that they felt the need to change, right? So the Greek changed it to angels and the Masoretic changed it to the number of the children of Israel. Um, so there was, there were theories already before that, that, well, given the nature of like how the Greeks saw the angels, how the Septuagint translates, you know, that this might have been a reference to, uh, like divine counsel. Um, and then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Dead Sea Scrolls contain a number of books of the Bible, um, which if you're saying the Dead Sea Scrolls don't claim to be inspired, then neither do the Masoretic or the Septuagint. Because all of them are just books of the Bible. They're, they're just the books of the Old Testament. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Deuteronomy, um, has that passage. And in that passage, we see that the Dead Sea Scrolls very specifically say uh, that El Elyon divided up the land according to the number of the sons of gods. And that he gives Yahweh his portion, which is Israel. Yeah, right. but so, I, so I, see exactly, I see exactly what you're doing. Okay, you're taking and, the words "sons of gods" in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and you're saying that that applies to the the gods of the nations. It doesn't, because this is a phrase that's used many times in the Bible, and it never refers to the nations. Sons um, of gods, or many times refer about half a dozen times refer to the angels. Okay, so where are you getting the polytheism in in this passage? So, for the sake of brevity, I'll ignore the sons of God's comment because um, the two places where it most prominently appears is in Job and in uh, Genesis, right, where it talks about the Nephilim and where it talks about the divine council in Job. Setting those aside, uh, even if even if the sons of God passage, uh, the sons of God phrase, which is a clear one in the ancient Near Eastern text uh, and culture, even if we were to say, well, you know, maybe it's ambiguous here. The way the passage reads is um, El Elyon, right, which is the name of a deity from that region, is the name of a Canaanite deity, that El Elyon divided up the, uh, the, the land according to the number of the sons of gods, and he gives Yahweh part of his share. Which yeah, I know. That's what very clearly said, implies number one that El Elyon and Yahweh are two different figures, and number two that if he divides the nation, uh, divides the land up to the sons of gods, and he gives Yahweh his portion, the implication there is that he's dividing the land up from the sons of the gods, and Yahweh is one of them, and he's getting his portion. Yeah, I understand I, that. That's what that document says, but we don't go by that document. You were basically telling us that Deuteronomy thirty-two seven and nine teaches polytheism yeah that's what you're saying yes and, that, and the way you get there is by saying well this document over here talks about elion giving land to yahweh so i put two and two together and i get five and that means there's polytheism in deuteronomy 32 no I mean, sir that, no me, sir that is not good scholarship it wouldn't be um again uh, much more straw to add to the pile um what i'm saying is that the dead sea scrolls predate the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, that we expected that something like that might have been the case, given that the Septuagint and the Masoretic text disagree on what that passage says anyways, and that the way that they disagree is suspiciously indicative of a potential reference to a divine council. And then we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, yes, which... But you can't prove it, read. okay? Suspiciously indicative does not mean that that is true. It means that what you, you want to do is take that 
quote that Babylonian document, wherever it, it talks about Elon, and you somehow want to. No, 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 no. I'm not taking a Babylonian document. I'm taking the book of Deuteronomy as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is a Hebrew now, all book. All the Dead Sea Scrolls Bible. say are sons of gods. That's all it says. Okay. And you don't even know if that's accurate or not, because that's not what the Masoretic text uses. It's yeah. also not what the Septuagint says. That's the thing. The Masoretic well, and the Septuagint I don't disagree. Claim the Septuagint is inspired either. They make a lot of mistakes. The Masoretic so, text is supposed to be the the copy of the original Hebrew inspired text. So that's what I'm going to go by. Nobody claims that it's the copy of the original Hebrew. They didn't have the original Hebrew to copy it. Well, they didn't have. What do you mean they didn't have the original Hebrew? I mean, the Masoretic text did. is done in the Middle Ages. They didn't have the original copies of the no, Hebrew text when they made it. The copy that was done by the Masoretes is claimed by them to be from the original Hebrew. That's what they claim. So is the Septuagint. The Septuagint claims that they had the original sat down and 70 uh, scribes all did their own translations of the Hebrew texts. And it was all like they compared the manuscripts and they were exactly the same so through all 70. Now you talk yeah, about they're both going to claim that every modern Bible translation also claims to be the best Bible translation, given all of the available data and right. information. So let's just say that's true. For the sake explains. of argument, let's say that's true. How can you make this hard and fast conclusion, then, that polytheism is taught in Deuteronomy, if you don't even know if the translations are correct or not? Uh, once again, we have three versions of the same text. We can line them up in chronological order and Conveniently, not only can we line them up in chronological order of when they were trans or when they were written or transcribed, but the way that they change from the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Masoretic, like before we had the Dead Sea Scrolls, scientists were oh sorry not scientists uh, scholars were able to predict that that might have been the case given that the given the way that the Septuagint disagrees with the Masoretic, like it was predicted that, hey, the way that these disagree seems to indicate that this passage might be referring to something like Sons of God, similar to like the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6, right? Sons of God saw the daughters of men were beautiful, right? It seems like maybe it's trying to refer to some the same sort of thing. And then the Dead Sea Scrolls are found, and they do, in fact, you've say said, You've said that already. Okay, so we don't need to go over that again. Do you have anything you want to uh, question me with or challenge me with? Yeah, I, I've got a, a number of things, actually. Um okay. First, I wanted to just make a couple of very important um, corrections. Uh, small thing, uh, but just for the sake of respect, uh, it wouldn't have been Jewish scribes that wrote the Old Testament. It would have been Hebrew scribes. They don't take the name Jews or the Jewish people until it's just Judea and Israel okay. is gone. All right. Um, I, agree with that. I, I just, that was just a, a yeah. I have, Jewish friends, and, and that's a big thing for them. Mm -hmm. um, da, 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 da. It actually does it start to use the word Jew, believe it or not, in Zechariah. That's the first place that it's found. Yeah, it's it's uh, we start to get it like after the fall of Israel, um, when it's just Judea. Like it's referring, yeah. it's Jew because they're just from Judea, whereas, you know, Hebrew yeah. uh, is, is the whole people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We covered a couple the way, of just just a quick note at this at this point um brendan has talked for about six or seven minutes more than more than robert so just like uh, you've had enough sure uh well and and he's been mostly asking me questions i, I have a couple of questions for him that I, I think will balance this a bit um so i also could uh when when it's appropriate i could also make a comment on what was just discussed. It would only take me about 20 seconds, but I'll wait till Brendan has finished what he needs to say. Oh, it's, it's about what we just discussed. Well, Brendan, can he? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so um, there's a very strong uh, piece of evidence in support of Robert's thesis that the Masoretic text is um, much more ancient than Brendan is claiming, because we know that St. Jerome uh, went to Palestine to learn Hebrew 
from the rabbis. And he had access to the best manuscripts that were available at the time. So he's a good 1600 years closer to the source. And of course, we know that our Lord could have written down his teaching. Instead, he established a church and gave the church divine authority to teach in his name. And the Catholic Church, established by Jesus at the Council of Trent, declared the Vulgate, Latin Vulgate of St. Jerome, to be free from any error in faith and morals. And it's the official translation of Scripture. So if you go to the Vulgate translation of Deuteronomy, this is how it translates Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse verses uh, 8 and 9. Um, I could give you the Latin, but this is a literal translation. If you want the Latin, I can give it to you as well. When the Most High divided the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he appointed the bounds of people according to the number of the children of Israel, but the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, the lot of his inheritance. So that's coming from St. Jerome's very faithful literal translation of the Hebrew based on the very best manuscripts available from the best teachers you could find in Palestine almost 2,000 years ago. And I think that's much more authoritative than the opinions of modern day biblical scholars. It's definitely not. Have to say. Um, Jerome's Vulgate is known to have been riddled with errors. Um, I, I'd be he's, he's correct. I I agree with that's you. not the point we're discussing, Brendan. Yeah, we're but, we're addressing right, but, your claim. Yeah, but You're, part no, of but listen, it's very is... important for people in the audience. It's very important, people in the audience. Please take note. What is at issue here, at the moment, is not the reliability of St. Jerome's translation per se. What's at issue is the claim that the apparently polytheistic language predates the language that does not contain any taint or hint of polytheism. And we have just given, and I'm addressing people in the audience who have an open mind, we've just given you a very clear example of an ancient text based on the best available Hebrew text at that time, which shows that there is absolutely no hint of polytheism. If you want to refute something, please refute the point that we're making and not some other point. Yeah, I, I was doing so before you uh, cut me off to tell me that I wasn't doing that. So. Um... Yeah. Sorry, I can't refute a point if I get interrupted before I get to refuting the point. Uh, Jerome's Holgate is known to have been actually riddled with errors, and part of why is because while he had the best, well, he had some of the best manuscripts available to him, and they weren't the best manuscripts that we have today. We have better manuscripts. Um, with those better manuscripts, modern versions of the Vulgate have been updated with language that uh, reflects those changes uh, in part to fix some of the issues that Jerome uh, introduced in his Vulgate. Uh, so it was cleaned up a little bit, and modern versions of the Vulgate are not word for word exactly what Jerome himself wrote. Do you know of any of those new manuscripts that you think are better that gives the translation of Deuteronomy 32, 7 and 9 as polytheism, teaching polytheism? Yeah, the Dead Sea Scrolls. They predate the Masoretic texts by 1,200 years. Uh, and no, the Mas We just went through this. The Dead Sea Scrolls all just say sons of gods. You're interpreting that to mean a certain thing. And that's our no. question to you. Where are you getting right. that from? Right. And, and as I have twice now already explained, two or three times, I've already explained. I'm not just basing this on the fact that it says sons of gods. And in fact, if it didn't say sons of gods the language there is still well 
it becomes a little bit harder to, to see without the sons of gods. But even like if you're asking, well, what are the sons of God? You look at uh, sons of gods, you look at the rest of the texts and the rest of the texts, uh, the rest of the text is very clear that, you know, he gives, uh, he divides up according to the number of the sons of God and he gives Yahweh his portion, right? Number one, that means El Elyon and Yahweh aren't the same all person. Right, number right, two, that. Go through it again. We know what you said. Right. Well, then stop uh, misrepresenting it. No, I'm if not you know what I, I'm just wondering well, how you. I'm not basing you. my whole argument off of the fact that sons of gods must be uh, polytheistic because of the culture around them or Babylon, whatever. No, I'm basing my argument off of the fact that uh, the passage explains what the sons of gods are by then telling us when El Elyon gives, you know, divides up to the sons of gods and gives Yahweh his portion. All right, let me ask you this. If let's just say for the sake of argument that what you're saying about Deuteronomy 32 from the Dead Sea Scrolls is correct, sure. do you know of any other place in the Pentateuch or even in the rest of the Bible where it teaches polytheism as a viable religion? Yeah. Um so there are there are a few instances in which it could maybe possibly allude to it, but it's not super clear. Nope. Nope. Um, but there are there are two places where it pretty explicitly explain uh, refers to it, right? So the first is in the uh, well, three really. Uh, the first is in the court of, or sorry, is in the book of Job, um, where we see the divine council and the description of the divine council is very similar to all of the other divine councils that we have and that's where we have one of the other uses of the term sons of god uh or sons of god sons of, right elohim is i believe what it uses it's plural and it's tricky to use but right sons of god sons of gods whichever uh but we see the sons of god mentioned there in job along with a description of the divine council the epilogue or sorry the prologue is in heaven and we see the divine council explained um, there's a lot of scholarship on that uh, that you're well, welcome wait, wait, to, let's just to deal with out. the first one from Job first. Well, sure. I, I understand the divine council, but where does the book of Job or any other book teach that there's more than one God and that the angels are gods, and thus we have polytheism taught in the book of Job? Yeah, so that's where you have to understand the context in which it's written, because it is referring, like it's using okay. language that you is... You have to know the intent. Clearly, <laughs> you, you have to know what the original readers would have understood. Mm -hmm. And if the original readers would have understood that to have been a reference to, you know, the divine council like we have in everywhere and, else... And you know then, the original readers thought that how? Because we have other references we have you mean other, other, other mesopotamian references that we have a multiple of gods and thus this passage in job has to be talking about the same thing is that what you mean other mesopotamian references in which very similar language is okay. employed all right. All right. ideas same are gotten way. across all right do you have anything else you want to ask me or um, any notes or anything like you want to something you didn't about? want the other examples cool no, no, because I, I know I know where you're going, where you're coming from, how you're handling it. So I don't need to have any more examples. I have something for you because you claim that there's a contradiction between God making all the animals at once. And then we find that um, a contradiction in Genesis 2 with the animals, because now um, the animals are uh, made before uh, Adam. And now he has to name that or I'm sorry, after Adam and he has to name them. What is a very simple explanation to that is that, yeah, all the animals were made in Genesis 1, okay, but there are certain animals that God brought to Adam because he wanted him to name them, okay? So it's not talking about another creation of the animals. It's talking about a situation in the Garden of Eden where Adam's the Lord and Master, and thus he gets to name these animals, and that's all that's happening. So it's not a contradiction. Uh, da, 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 da. let me if I could just add one thing to that um since I uh Dan told us that we have a little bit of time coming to us um this is yet another example of where contrary to what Brendan has said 
St. Jerome's translation proves its superiority because uh, St. Jerome, being a master of biblical Hebrew, understood that Hebrew does not have the tenses of Latin and Greek, and therefore the correct tense had to be supplied from the context. And so when you read the Vulgate, um, you don't find any contradiction such as Brendan has asserted between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, because in the Vulgate, which is St. Jerome's faithful translation of the Hebrew text, he says, God having created the animals, he brings them to Adam. And I would like the audience also to take note of another very important point. Brendan has asserted that St. Jerome's version of the scriptures was not as good as the versions that modern scholars have. Please, my brothers and sisters in the audience, how could Brendan possibly know that to be true? St. Jerome lived in the fourth and fifth centuries. And Brendan is asserting as if it was a self-evident proposition that the manuscripts that scholars have today, three quarters of, of the history of Christianity later, um, more than that, uh, are somehow superior. How could he possibly know that? And does it even make sense when it simply goes against common sense to believe that St. Jerome would have been satisfied with anything less than the most accurate scriptures, because we understand that Brendan does not consider the scriptures to be the inspired word of God. St. Jerome dedicated his life, would have shed his last drop of blood for the truth of every word in scripture. So it makes no sense to think that he sought out and obtained anything less than the most accurate scriptures available to him in the Hebrew language. Um, yeah, Hugh, that was fairly dishonest. Um, and, and I would like to address that real quick. Um, number one, I never claimed that I know this as if it's like some thing that I came up with because I'm just so smart. What I'm saying is that the scholarly community has written on this. It, there, even back, like we we knew, even uh, if you look into the history of the writing of the Vulgate, uh, the way that it was written, like even Jerome knew, like he was rushed through parts of it. He knew that the translation was uh, that his uh, translation was not the most accurate, but he had been tasked to get it done, and he got it done. Um, it's not that I know and I'm standing in like the face of common sense and reason. It's that it's well attested. Jerome himself believed it and scholarship asserts it. I'm not claiming to know it. I'm claiming to have looked at the evidence as presented by the whole testimony of uh, scholarship of the history of the translation um, and through all of that, that yeah, it is known with like I use the word we because kind of the like like to, to indicate plurality, trying to assert, trying to frame this as if I'm saying this and I'm saying this in face of all scholars and evidence, and I stand on my own because I just think that I know everything uh, is dishonest and is framing the debate in a way that is just not the fitting of a proper scholarly debate. I do not appreciate it. I am not saying that. And when I said that the Vulgate was not uh, was not accurate, I didn't claim to be the one saying that either. I made it clear that that is the consensus of scholarship. Okay, but let um, me and ask yes, you this then. through archaeology, we are able to discover, like we are able to dig up and find texts that are older than the sorts of things that they would have been able to have at the time. Uh, we know what Jerome was working with. It's recorded. We know what manuscripts he was working with. And we also know through careful study in archaeology um, and textual analysis, we also know that the uh, that our modern understanding through uh 
you know, archaeological discoveries and lexicography is more advanced than what Jerome had to work with at the time, even Rush job aside. So yes, I am mm-hmm. certain that, but I'm not saying that I know that. I'm saying that this is well documented within scholarship, and you All can right. read that. Let me ask you about the documentation. You, sure. I believe, are referring to Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, and possibly Codex Alexandrinus. Is that correct? Am I correct in zeroing in on that? I I believe so. I, I start to get the the codexes a little bit mixed up. Uh, yeah, I, I, I they start to get a little bit iffy, but I believe so. Okay, so. Uh, now, Codex Vaticanus does have the Hebrew text. Uh, Codex uh, Sinaiticus has some of it. So does Alexandrinus. So the scholars that try to say that Jerome was working from a, what you would call um, a um, corrupt text in the Hebrew, they use Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus to show that the Hebrew in those texts are a little different than what uh, what Jerome used for the Vulgate, the Hebrew text that he used for the Vulgate. Okay, but see sure. that doesn't that doesn't prove anything, because these texts, as good as Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are, they have problems, big problems. I know dissertations yeah. that have been written about the problems with these two texts. That when Tischendor found them. They were supposed to be, oh, sent from heaven. We got these new texts from the 4th and 5th century. When exactly, that's exactly the time that Jerome was writing the uh, the Vulgate, okay? We finally got these texts in the 18th century from Tischendorf, but as we studied them more and more and more, we began to say, look, they got the same flaws as every other Greek text has. They're no better. Whereas before we thought they were better. So to make the argument that we got better text than what Jerome was using, that's an argument that can't be proved. We had uh, textual criticism is a wide open field that nobody has said, oh yeah, now we have the supreme text. You can't do that. I but uh, I think his major point, if you don't mind me going on for a second or so, yeah, yeah go for it. His, his major point is look, the Masoretes did their thing, okay. Jerome had a different, had his Hebrew text that he used in the 4th century, okay, or 5th century. Where did that come from? Now, we know that the Hebrews were very astute in writing or copying the Hebrew text. We know that tradition tells us that if they wrote the whole Pentateuch and they went back to read it and they found one mistake, they would throw the whole thing out and start over again. It's like these guys who used to make Rolls Royces, you know, if they found one one sound they shouldn't hear after it was all done, they scrapped the whole engine and started over again. That that was the Hebrew mentality. This mentality gave us very accurate Hebrew text, and that's what Jerome was working with, okay? So for you to make a conclusion that somehow the Masoretic text, which copied the, the same Hebrew text that Jerome had, because it didn't disappear, obviously. It had to still be around. Um, you know, they're being pretty accurate. Okay, so... How do you what evidence... So, so, first of all, what period are you talking about that the Hebrew, that that was the mentality of the uh, Hebrew Jewish scribes? Uh, what, what period are you referring to? I'm talking about pre-New Testament. When they were okay. copying Hebrew texts, so first century. Um, first of all, I'd be curious to see what evidence you have for that, because we have plenty of evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls well, that suggests that, that wasn't right the case. Now. It's hearsay right. right now. I'm just telling you that's what I've heard about the the ancient yeah. Hebrews. They were very meticulous about their texts. Yeah, we have a lot of evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls that suggests otherwise. Um, like that's one of the reasons why the Dead Sea Scrolls have been such an important discovery for us is that we have a glimpse into how the Jews handled the biblical texts pre-Christianity uh, in a way that we just didn't have before. Uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls don't indicate that there was this like 
extreme level of textual fidelity. It indicates that, uh, in fact, it was a very complicated and messy process. And we have... Uh, I'm a little puzzled in the, to ask how you can make that judgment since you just admitted to us that you really didn't know about all these Greek texts that I brought to the fore here to make an argument. You were yeah, like, the reason oh, I don't I know, know about I, I don't know about this. I may not know about that. And then now you're making these definitive judgments about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, like, the reason I don't know about all of these like little Greek texts is because I don't care. I'd rather get my information from the best manuscripts that we have, which... Uh, for the Hebrew scriptures, we have the Masoretic, we have the Septuagint, and we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and I have taken special care to look into study uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, yeah, I, I don't know why you would like be surprised that I have a, an area of a specialty that I focused on, as opposed to just somehow knowing all about all of the manuscripts. Um, but I very specifically chose to focus on the best of the manuscripts that we have available to us um, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, especially because they are the oldest manuscripts that we have um, and they are horribly interesting. There's just a lot of information there that's really, really intriguing. Um, and well, I, I, I would just I would just advise you that. in your scholar scholarship that you don't imply to people or in or yeah imply that the 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 israelites believed in polytheism because we have this verse here in 32 deuteronomy 32 that if i compare it to these other passages well yeah they're they they believed in polytheism i i you just can't go that way okay as, uh, as a scholar you can suggest well there may be some tie here you know but to make a conclusion that the Israelites were polytheists because the Bible allowed it? I mean, come on. That's, that's yeah, a, absolutely. a leap. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It definitely would be a leap for me to make by myself. Um, okay. I'm not asserting that. Scholars are asserting that. Um, right. okay, I literally, I have right. a... I'm not debating them right now. I'm right. But, and and uh, specifically, you're trying to make this claim that, well, I shouldn't go around asserting that. Um I, I'm I'm not. I'm informing people that that's what scholars say. Okay. All right. That's uh, all right. My like I I and and this is not a little known thing. I have a friend who works uh, for Wycliffe as a uh, Bible translator. He is uh, very like he's he's been going to conferences and working very hard to uh, to understand. You know, he's he's a master of Greek. He knows quite a bit about other languages. His focus is the New Testament. Uh, and one of the things that they talk about with the translators is that, yeah, we know that English translations have kind of edged away from uh, these polytheistic passages, uh, even when we have clear evidence that they are there, right? It, it chooses other translations. Don't do that when you go to these cultures in these areas, because these cultures in these areas uh still having a polytheistic background are going to better understand the context if you leave it in its original context. So okay. this isn't my assertion. This isn't me saying. This is what scholarship says and is okay. clear right. and unambiguous. And okay. if you have an issue with it, go read the scholarship. Oh, I've read it. Because uh, there's quite a bit more even to them the points that I'm making. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole lot of it out there. Uh, Dan, are you going to close this and can we give concluding remarks or how, how are we going to do this? Sure. Yeah, um, we've we've gone quite a bit longer than intended, but I I, I wanted to make sure we 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 uh, covered everything you wanted to cover. So, is there anything that either of you still want to? Brendan, is there still any more points that you wanted to make, or um, or does does anybody have to leave soon? Uh, I I would just like to give a concluding remark because um, you know we were supposed to stop at nine, and I do have to go. So, okay. Sure. Uh, we can close it up if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, that would be fine. And and right now. Um, Robert, you still actually have four extra minutes. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, if I could, could I just ask one thing very quickly? Yeah, go ahead, you. Sure. Um, Brendan, I just want to make sure we understand. Are you, were you saying that St. Augustine did not take, did not consider Genesis to be written in the genre of history? Uh. I am saying that uh, that uh, I guess uh, that Augustine 
uh, did not consider the creation account to be a literal uh, presentation. Okay, so my brothers and sisters in the audience, I would like to ask you to please get out your copy of the literal interpretation of Genesis by St. Augustine, and uh, you will find this statement there. He says, Genesis, the narrative in Genesis, is not written in the style of allegory as is the canticle of canticles, but from beginning to end in the style of history as is the book of Chronicles. So that is a total refutation of what Brendan has asserted because he says from beginning to end, Genesis is in the genre of history. And now I have to let Brother Robert uh, give the closing statement. Uh, do you mind if I respond to that just real quick before the closing statement? Uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, St. Augustine in the very same work also argues that uh, the first two chapters of Genesis were written in a style that was meant for the people to comprehend and does not necessarily mean that they should be taken uh, as more than uh, more than allegory in this same work. So it, for people who are interested, for the audience, uh, pick up a copy of the literal meaning of Genesis, read through and see what Augustine has to say. Okay, All so right. um, I'm going to give some closing remarks here and then I'm going to take off. Uh, Brendan, uh, uh, thank you for your participation, first of all. And what I have to say in conclusion is probably a little bit more personal than scholarly, okay? And that's because I know your history. You know, you came, you were an evangelical, then you became a Catholic for a while, and now you're an atheist. I, I have to say, I haven't seen that route taken by too many people, Um so it's intriguing to me how you ended up as an atheist from being both Protestant and Catholic prior to that. But I, I would just conclude by saying one thing struck me in this whole debate, which was, I and I think I had asked you about this, because I said, if you think that myths that were floating around were accepted by the Hebrews, and they just lived off this myth, whatever they did with it. The fact is they have a myth. It's not the truth. And all the other countries, uh, all the other cultures, they all have different myths. But they're all myths. They're all lies, basically. You know, see, see, that's the difference between Christianity that we were trying to teach here, which is there is a truth amongst all the myths and legends out there which most of the world believes and i'd say 95 percent of them believe in myths and legends you know i read Iliad, iliadi's book um and when i was a, a religion major in college talking about myths and how all the cultures believed in myths and stuff and what invariably what they try to do is put christianity in that mix of just believing in myths, just like every other religion. So there's no distinction. But the, the truth is, and I know this to be the truth, is that, no, the Israelites were given the truth, the exact truth that God wanted them to have, not a myth, not a legend. And the problem with the Israelites was that they didn't obey the truth that God gave them. And that's why they ended up the way they did. And therefore, they have no excuse. So I implore you to regroup, retrace your steps. Go back to those times where you are not going to let myths and legends rule your thinking. That there has to be a God out there. Otherwise, I wouldn't see all that I'm seeing. And he has to be true. And he's not going to lie to me. He's going to give me the truth. That's where I would love to see you come back to. And I don't know if I played any part in that tonight, but that's where you need to be. All right. And we will close there. So thank you. Thank you all for participating in this debate. And thanks for staying over time. It was a, a really great discussion. Um, 
I will contact you all later on about how you can view the recording afterwards. So thanks again. I hope you all have a good night. Thank oh, and, you. Uh, yeah. and, Appreciate and, it. Thank you. And then Hugh, um, if you could please lead us in a, in a closing prayer as well. Yes. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. My Father, we thank you so much for all your blessings. And we thank you especially for the gift of faith. And we ask your forgiveness for any lack of respect for you or your revelation that may have been offered unintentionally. And we ask you to please grant us all the grace to know the truth and to embrace that truth with our whole being and to know your love so that we can love you and all creatures with that same love. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. Right. God bless. Bye-bye. Right. Right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.